I'm Michelle in Boston. And I'm Tequina Boston. Invite historical drama fans you know to subscribe to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters wherever they enjoy their favorite podcast. Subscribers receive notifications about new episodes and bonus content. Sign up for our newsletter on our webpage at michonbostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters or on our Instagram bio link at Historical Drama Sisters and receive news and announcements about upcoming podcasts and historical drama activities. Enjoy the podcast and thank you for listening. Welcome to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. I'm Michonne Boston. And I'm Tequina Boston. It's time for our annual preview of the new season of the PBS drama series, Masterpiece and Masterpiece Mystery, with executive producer Suzanne Simpson. Masterpiece and Masterpiece Mystery are part of our historical drama watching origin story, as you'll hear in this podcast. The Emmy Award-winning Downton Abbey may have been Masterpiece's most watched series, attracting new audiences. But as we've noticed through this podcast, there are dedicated audiences for all creatures great and small, and for Masterpiece Mysteries, Miss Scarlet and the Duke, and Grant Chester. We admit to watching some of the contemporary dramas in Masterpiece and Masterpiece Mystery, but the historical drama series continue to be our windows to the past and mirrors of the present. We look forward to our annual conversations with Suzanne for her insights into the continuing historical dramas and to spotlight new historical dramas. This season, that includes Wolf Hall, The Mirror and the Light, based on the final novel in Dame Hilary Mantel's multi-award winning trilogy about Thomas Cromwell and Henry VIII. The series is adapted by Peter Strong. This is Masterpiece's second Wolf Hall and will premiere in 2025. We also talk with Suzanne about Miss Austin, a series adapted by Andrea Gibb from Jill Hornby's best-selling novel. Miss Austin is inspired by the real-life literary mystery involving Cassandra Austin, who burned her famous sister Jane Austen's letters after Jane's death. Masterpiece has been a go-to for Jane Austen fans, as we've seen with Sanditon, which has not only been popular for Masterpiece, but for historical drama with the Boston Sisters as well. Our Sanditon podcasts are among the top five downloads. 2025 will be the 250th anniversary of Jane Austen's birth. We anticipate Miss Austen will stir more conversation around perceptions and assumptions about author Jane Austen. Since 1971, Masterpiece and Masterpiece Mystery have brought American audiences, in their words, the best in drama, and British drama specifically. We say that's no exaggeration. The series broadcasts on Sundays on local PBS stations, so check your local listings and new episodes are available for streaming for a limited time after broadcast on pbs.org backslash masterpiece. Let us know your favorite masterpiece and masterpiece mystery series and characters by writing us to podcast at michonbostongroup.com. Now enjoy the conversation with Suzanne Simpson, executive producer of PBS Masterpiece and Masterpiece Mystery with a preview of the 2024-2025 season. Welcome back, Suzanne, to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. I'm so happy to be here again. It's great to see you. Our PBS Masterpiece Mystery season highlights have become an annual tradition since Tequina and I started the podcast in 2021. You were one of our first guests. I remember Um, Now, just on a personal note, PBS Masterpiece is where I developed my passion and interest in historical drama, starting with, I think it was I, Claudius. I saw the series. I read Robert Graves' book afterwards. I think that's what you like to see happen when people watch it. We're hoping that it does kind of encourage interest in reading. I mean, certainly that's the, those are the beginnings of Masterpiece, everything for the most part, was based on literature. 
um, in the beginning, especially. So our conversations with you and the people from the Masterpiece and Mystery series are very special for us and our historical drama community. So we're so happy to have you back with us again and look forward to talking about more Masterpiece Mystery series in this podcast this season. So here we are, big picture. <laughs> Give us the historical drama highlights for the 2024-2025 season of Masterpiece and Mystery. What are the new series this season? And is there a thematic arc you're working with? Well, that's a very good question about the thematic arcs. Um, let me start with, um, you know, under the umbrella of costume drama, we include both what we might call uh, frock drama, which begins in kind of more or less the 1800s. We have historical drama that might even go further back, and I'll talk about Wolf Hall in a minute, but that's from the 1500s. And we also include period dramas like All Creatures Great and Small and Miss Scarlet. So we have a big umbrella for what we might call our, our costume dramas on Masterpiece. And uh, next season, starting at the very beginning of 2025, uh, we're bringing back All Creatures Great and Small, which is, of course, one of our biggest shows and one of our biggest fan favorites. I've uh, been so pleased we've been able to keep that series going and that the cast want to keep coming back for it. And uh, so that's coming up early in January, uh, along with Miss Scarlet which is going to be at 8 o'clock before All Creatures. And those of you who've been following Miss Scarlet will notice that it's no longer Miss Scarlet and the Duke. And so it's not dot, dot, dot either. <laughs> it's not <laughs> dot, dot, dot either. So the, uh, you'll all be introduced to a new character. And um, this new character, you're going to see a relationship building with Scarlett. Um, when Stuart decided to leave, you know, there was the question, do we continue this series or do we not? Do we just recast the Duke or not? Do we bring in a new character? And I think the writer especially felt that there was still a lot to explore with Miss Scarlett, the lead character. And she felt strongly that, um, there was a lot more to do with that character, and yes, that she would bring in a new character into the story, not try to recast the Duke. And so that's why we've made a decision to lose the Duke um, part of the title. But we feel if the audience loves Miss Scarlet as much as I do, that they'll give us a chance uh, to present this new character and some new storylines for her. So that's our big coming out in the winter. And then we're going to have an amazing spring next year. And it will start with Wolf Hall, The Mirror and the Light. And for many of the Masterpiece viewers who've been with us for a while, 10 years ago, we did an adaptation of Wolf Hall and Bring Up the Bodies as one six-part series. And that was a tremendous uh, program for us because not only was it done exquisitely by Peter Kosminski, the director, the lead actor was Mark Rylance in the role of Thomas Cromwell and Damian Lewis playing Henry VIII. And they are both back again mm -hmm. to Yay, play yeah. those <laughs> roles 10 years later in The Mirror and the Light. And one of the reasons why it took that long is that um, Hillary was still writing the book and didn't complete it until a couple of years ago. And um, sadly, I think you know that she passed away. Um, so she was involved in the very beginning stages of writing the screenplay for this new series. And um, Peter Strawn, who is the screenplay writer, has done absolutely amazing job condensing what was 
you know, almost a thousand page book, I think, into a six part series. And uh, Mark Rylance uh, as Thomas Cromwell, this is uh, a little bit the beginning of the end for him. In the first series, we watched his rise to power. Now we're seeing him at his height of power in the mirror and the light and what will come after that. And so it's a very powerful, very emotional series. I I can't tell you how many times I really felt very emotional for him. Uh, You begin to feel that close to him. And we're so fortunate uh, to have the series. When it came to us originally 10 years ago, we thought it was a series that would go to one of the streamers or HBO. And uh, strangely enough, uh, some of them turned it down because they didn't think Mark Rylance was a big enough name for them for the lead role. And and when Playground, uh, the producers of the show, came to us, of course, our reaction was, Mark Rylance, are you kidding? He's known as the best actor in England. You know, he'd run the globe. Anyway, we were just thrilled to have him. And uh, so we had to wait some time after Hillary finished her book to develop the show. And then we had to wait a little bit longer because both Damien, who had been doing Billions, and Mark, who had been doing a lot of um, pieces, some of his own work, uh, we had to wait for them to be available to do this. And it is wholly worth the wait. <laughs> it, it's really fantastic. Um, so, and there's you know, some other very interesting uh, characters in this. Uh, Certainly the Cardinal comes back, Jonathan Price, and uh, it's just a very emotional story. I've been watching the cuts recently because it's just now being finished. And so I just watched episode five yesterday, and I'm about to watch episode six, and I just, I literally can't wait. I think I'll, I'll I'll press play the minute it comes to my my inbox. So um, very excited about that show. And uh, we have another terrific program that would fall under that umbrella of costume drama that is about Jane Austen, and it's called Jane uh, Miss Austen. But you would think that would mean Jane, and it doesn't. It means Cassandra. And Cassandra was her older sister. And this story takes off, and I, I think you said you've read the book, so you actually know uh, we both have the story yes. is about, right? So this uh, is based on a novel by uh, uh, Jill Hornby, who is Nick Hornby's sister. Oh. Yes, little known fact. And she has been very interested in Jane Austen for a number of years, and she has done uh, an incredible amount of original research. And so she really comes to this armed with a lot of knowledge about what might have taken place during that time. This is still fictionalized, but um, armed with a lot of background. And I don't know I'm sure you're kind of Jane Austen watchers. A lot of our audience are Jane Austen watchers. And some people know that there was always, uh, there's always been a question about why Cassandra burnt all of Jane's letters after she passed away. And Jill actually tries to answer that question in this book. And so the story takes place over two time periods. The first is uh, Cassandra is now, uh, Jane has passed away. Cassandra is living on her own in Chawton House, and she finds out that a relative is on uh, their deathbed, and so she goes to be with um, that person. And that person was to be her father-in-law before her betrothed died. And what happens when she arrives at the house, Kintbury, is that all those memories from her earlier time uh, begin to flood her. 
uh, because she's now remembering back to uh, the time that she was with her um, fiancé uh, at the time. And in her part of her reason for going back um, to this house, Kintbury, is because she knows that Jane had written many letters to their cousin. Um, and so she's gone back to find those letters, to find out what's in those letters, and decide to take them with her, you know, to keep them from falling into the wrong hands. And we find out that the person who is the wrong hands for the letter is uh, a sister-in-law who has an idea that she's going to have her son write a grand uh, biography on uh, her sister-in-law's son uh, and also on Jane, and Cassandra doesn't want that to happen. She doesn't- it would be a tell-all. It'd be a tell-all, and let's say that Mary doesn't um, Mary might have a grudge or two against Jane, yeah, and so yeah. it, Cassandra may feel that it's unfair uh, the way that Mary looked at her sister. So this becomes Cassandra's mission to find these letters, and when she does, she reads them, and that flashes back to the time when she and Jane were much younger and they were in the process of meeting men and deciding, you know, whether they wanted to be married or not married and who they might marry and all of the complications that come with that. So it's this wonderful two time period story and it's across uh, four episodes. It's a four episode mini series. One of the things we were really excited about is that Keely Hawes agreed to play Cassandra. And our audience will know Keely Hawes because she was the mother in The Durrells. Um, people who watch a lot of British drama will know her from Bodyguard. And people who read the Daily Mail will know that she's the wife of Matthew McFadden, who has won an Emmy for his role in Succession as Tom. So, um, you know, she's a, a beloved actress in the UK and uh, certainly by our audience. So we were thrilled when she decided uh, she would play that role. Yeah. It's a very poignant story. And what also came through in the novel for me is how precarious women's financial situation oh my God. was in those times. Even Jane Austen as this kind of celebrated authoress, it, it was not a good situation for women, for sure. Unmarried women, especially. Unmarried women, yes. Yeah. You know, that too was my impression when I read the book, was that it was as much about the lack of options for women in that time period. And in some ways, how brave they all were um, because they really had to manage that. And if they were lucky, they had family members or older brothers or wealthy relatives who would make sure that they had a place to live. And if they didn't, um, there weren't many occupations for women at that time period. And uh, certainly for women who might have been considered of a certain let's say, educated class, um, they might only find jobs as teachers or governesses or jobs that might really be a little bit below their station in life, uh, as seen by others, but might have been the only option um, that they had to make their way. And for Jane to be a writer at the time, I, I think a lot of people know that she couldn't even publish the works under her name. Um, you know, it was novels written by a lady. So, uh, it, you know, she really didn't become as famous until she uh, passed away. So it's, it's really a wonderful look because there's so many women characters as part of the story. Cassandra comes into Kentbury and it turns out that there's um, the daughter of the man who's dying is now bereft uh, 
because she also must move out of the house because her father uh, was the rector of the house. And so now he has to leave it and she really doesn't have anywhere to go except to possibly live with one of her two sisters. And let's say those aren't great choices for no, her. They're not. <laughs> no, they're not great choices. Um, so there's a, a wonderful uh, story. Um, it's really kind of a, a romance story in that uh, time period that Cassandra is in looking for the letters. And then there's a lot of great uh, romance in the flashbacks to their earlier times as young women. Um, but yeah, I like the book as much for that, that it's about what women's options were at the time. And this is coming out in the spring of 2025? It is. So we'll have uh, Wolf Hall, Mirror in the Light, will start March 23rd. We haven't announced the date of Miss Austin, I think, but it, it, comes, it follows immediately after. after so definitely something to look forward to in the spring season. Yes. I do have a question about what Austin fans and Austin audiences, what, what you anticipate will be the reaction because it's not your everyday Jane Austen story. It's definitely not Pride and Prejudice. That's <laughs> it's not. Sure. <laughs> it's not even Persuasion or yeah. Mansfield Park <laughs> or, or Sense and Sensibility. <laughs> it it's not because it isn't Jane Austen's voice. It it is really a story. Um, about Jane and her relationship with her sister. And so, no, it's, it's not your enter the world of a country house um, and uh, find out that your neighbor, uh, you don't like him to begin with, and then it turns out he's the one you're going to marry, which is, you know, Emma. So it's different, but I really felt when I read it that it, just was more about what it was really like um, for Jane in her time. And I think because people have so much respect for her writing. I mean, I turn back to it, you know, every once in a while when I want to be entertained because I think she has really one of the funniest voices. Um, and uh, such as we all know, an observant uh, nature in, in terms of looking at people and being able to describe them and their relationships and, and all of that. So she's an enormously talented individual, and I hope this explains a little bit about what she went through to be able to uh, write her novels and what an amazing support Cassandra was throughout her life. Um, and how meaningful that relationship was to Jane. And so I think we get um, kind of a look at uh, what Jane herself went through to be able to be a writer. It wasn't an easy path for her. You've been enjoying Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, a podcast where we talk about historical drama series and films as windows to the past and mirrors of the present. Visit our webpage at michonbostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters. Share this podcast. Join our historical drama community by signing up for our newsletter to stay up to date on future episodes and bonus content. Now, back to our podcast conversation. Let's talk a bit about Wolf Hall. I love the first series. You know, I don't know what it is, but Anne Boleyn is always the character for me. <laughs> and to have Claire Foy in the first season, of course, we won't see her this season in this version. <laughs> she was wonderful. But um, yeah, Damian Lewis, at first when I saw that he was playing Henry VIII in the first season, I said, wow, he's going to have to gain a lot of weight. But he didn't. And it works. It, it, it's it works. It, you know, you really have to give credit to him because he is wearing basically, a, you know, a suit that makes him look much bigger than he is. And for him to take on that in the way that he's acting 
it makes you totally believe he's this larger than life kind of person. And certainly with the kind of costuming that he wears as a king, I mean, he has an enormous presence um, as Henry VIII. Um, so I, I do think that's all credit to Damien uh, for being able to really put that across in his performance. Suzanne, um, as you've heard us say, we look at historical drama as a window to the past and a mirror of our present. And recently, um, I was at the National uh, Museum of American History. There's an actress, they have a history theater, and she talked about using her theater um, performance as a way of developing empathy in the audience for people of the past and the present. Mm. Mm. And what I was wondering is, as you look at what's coming in the season with Wolf Hall and with Miss Austin, what do you see those productions, those, those uh, historical series mirroring in terms of the times we're living through now? Well, certainly, uh, Mirror in the Light is about power and the fragility of the position of power. It's about deceit. Um, it's about uh, dominance. It is about people who are pretty much willing to do anything to maintain a position of power. And in those days, the power was given by the king. So it was about how close were you to the power, because the king is the one who could bestow upon you uh, wealth, uh, family connections, land, the things that were very important to people at that time. And uh, I think today, I think we can all see that power is something that is still being sought by not only people in politics, but people in the corporate world. I mean, we all just watched Succession, which was uh, a kind of magnificent look at how people gain it, how they lose it all those reasons, how much of themselves they're willing to give away to get it, um, how you can be a person with all the best intentions. Maybe you're trying to gain power so that you can give it to your children or to the people you love, but at what cost to you? And I think that choices are things that you know, we all make in our lives. And I think this show is about the choices that Thomas Cromwell makes. Um, possibly believing he is making them for the right reasons and maybe not quite prepared for the consequences of those choices. And I think, again, that's something that we can all relate to. And in watching the show, you wonder why he makes certain choices the way he does. So I think um, I think it's really compelling um, for a lot of different reasons, but I think that's one of them. We do a lot of adaptations on this podcast. We've, we've talked about a lot of them and we've loved them, enjoyed them. And there are some challenges to that as well. But what can people get out of Hilary Mantel's books about this history that they won't be getting out of a history book or vice versa. Because we can all we know how this ends if we go to the history. Right. Yeah. We know how, what unfolds and how this story ends. But what does a fiction writer bring to this story? You know, that is a it's a really excellent question, and I might answer it in my own way. I'm not sure others would answer it the same way, but one of the things that I uh, certainly feel is true in my job as the executive producer of Masterpiece is that when you're doing dramas, the dramas are about characters. 
And what you're building throughout a season is the character. And that is a lot about the character's psychology, why they choose to do the things they do, why they don't do the other. And so you're constantly evaluating what that care, why they're choosing to do what they're doing, what has led them to this place. And what that's what I love about Hilary Mantel's book is that if you just read the history, you would have no sense of Cromwell as the person. You would only be able to see his actions and possibly the result of those actions. But what you wouldn't get is that feeling of a man in that time period with those particular circumstances, why he might choose to do certain things. Who, who were the people he loved? Who were the people he was trying to stay away from? You get an inner view, and that's what Hilary Mantel did, an inner view of what was important to him. And, you know, he felt, and I, this isn't giving it away because it's in the book and it's in history, but he felt that one of the things he needed to do was to save uh, Henry's daughter, Mary, um, from, uh, let's say, save her from herself. <laughs> that may have not been in his best interest, but that seems to have been a motivation for many of the choices that he made and the actions that he took. And that is what Hilary Mantel explores in her book. And I think Peter Strawn has done a brilliant job because sometimes in books, you know, that's all the interior workings, you know, and when you come to film, you have to be able to balance what's going on in an actor's mind or a character's mind with the actions that they take. And how much dialogue do you need to hear and how much of it can be portrayed through the performance of the actor. And what I find extraordinary about this particular work is that so much is conveyed through the performances by Mark and Henry. It's, in a way, it has almost the feel of a feature film instead of a television series. And I say that because oftentimes uh, people want television series to be accessible so you don't lose your viewership, you know, make it a little easier for them to follow what's happening. And um, and I would say that the mirror and the light is not, you, you really have to pay attention. And pay attention not only to the dialogue, but you have to pay attention to what the characters are thinking, feeling, because that is coming through in their performance. And, you know, you can't be on your phone. <laughs> you can't be multitasking and really get the full enjoyment of this show um, unless you're willing to really commit yourself to watching it and seeing every nuance um, in what's happening in a particular scene between characters, among characters, and all the rest. And for me, that is the true joy of it. That's the true joy. It's a bit of discovering it yourself. You're not being told what to think. You're discovering what you think. And I find that challenging, but I find it also to be um, pure joy. And it, you know, it is a very profound piece. And I hope people, you know, even if it's a little hard and they don't exactly know who people are, that they really just stay with it because I think it's so rewarding um, as a piece of work. And from what you said, it sounds like uh, what the act actress that I mentioned earlier, her name is Julie Garner, said that's how you create the empathy. And yeah. also how you become, I think, a little less judgmental. Yes, exactly. Because characters, I mean, if they're, 
if they're drawn well, right? Characters are not necessarily all good, all bad. Yes. It's, it's a real art to be able to create sympathy for, or empathy for a character who's not always doing the right thing. And it's nuanced and, and that makes it interesting too. Suzanne, uh, our final question. I mean, this, I can't wait for Wolf Hall. I can't wait for (laughs) Miss Austin. Miss Austin. Yeah. You know, and when you say, oh, it's coming in 2025, it's like, oh, you know, I know. I'm just sorry. right here. How do we get through the fall? But um, <laughs> we are noticing that there's a lot more historical dramas on the streaming services. I mean, we've even done Bridget in Here, which is on Netflix, and we've done on this podcast, um, we the Gentleman Pachinko. in Moscow. We've done Pachinko. Oh, in addition to Masterpiece. Yeah. Killers of the Flower Moon, which isn't a series, but it's on yes. Apple. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you even referenced Secession. Yes. Which is on HBO. And, you know, for these streaming services who probably don't appreciate people like Mark, um, who's playing Cromwell. <laughs> <laughs> which is weird which, given the which global is so weird. Reach, I know. Right? I'm like, <laughs> now it's. I thought we were global. Wait. <laughs> Yeah, 10 years ago, maybe not, but I think now they totally appreciate him. Yeah. But is this having an impact on the Masterpiece brand that more people are getting into it? I mean, Shogun just took all the Emmys practically. Oh gosh. It um, just, yeah. How is this, um, how, how are you guys managing? How is this uh, affecting any collaborations you may have with the UK? You know, um, the industry has changed so much. I mean, you're ref- referencing the streamers, you know, years ago, and I think, you know, you probably have to go back 15 or 20 years ago. Um, no one in the U.S. was interested in British-made drama. No one. HBO was if Helen Mirren was in the lead. But we really were in a place where... Uh, Masterpiece was almost left alone to choose which historical dramas we thought might work for our audience. And then Downton Abbey happened, and it said to many people, because they've all told me, that they suddenly realized that an American audience would accept a British-made show. And I think the pandemic showed Everybody loved foreign language films. I mean, it just really, there's such an appetite now for so many different kinds of drama. And I think the audience for in America certainly has that appetite now. And I think the streamers like Apple and others um, do have the resources to bring to a show like Shogun I think uh, what we've always tried to do, which is that level of historical accuracy, something that really truly feels authentic, as well as being a a very high quality, uh, written and uh, performed with great actors and all the rest. And they have the resources. There once was room for, I would say, uh, costume drama that was maybe not at that very expensive level. So there, you know, we had Victoria and we had Poldark and they were done for a very reasonable uh, sum of money. And they were kind of the staples of BBC and ITV for a long time. And then uh, just all these contemporary dramas took off and, and everybody in the UK was focused on all these great contemporary dramas and all of a sudden historical uh, drama did not seem at, at, at the price point that we were looking at. It did not feel like that was something they wanted to make or that their audience was interested in watching. They're still interested in the very expensive, you know, Bridgerton, Gilded Age, Shogun, you know, those kinds of shows, but we can't compete at that price point. So one of the things that um, I've had to do in recent years is that I have had to develop shows uh, directly with producers in the UK and with writers to develop shows that would be at 
a level that we can afford to make them and not necessarily with a UK broadcaster to start. So Miss Austin is something I developed with the producer, Christine Langan. Uh, We paid for all of the script development. And after the scripts were complete, only then did the BBC come in as a partner with us. And so that's a complete reversal Yeah, how things used to be. But because our audience expects us to have those kind of costume dramas, we have to be initiating them at a price point that we can afford to make them. So it's changed. So some shows, I mean, that's what happened with Miss Austin. If you've watched Moonflower Murders, you know that also has kind of a 1950s Agatha Christie timeline with it. Well, that was another show that uh, I had to develop with the producers because the BBC just wasn't ready to come on board with it. But once we developed it and we had scripts, the BBC also joined with that show as well. So now Magpie and Moonflower are, you know, have been on the BBC. So again, it's kind of a reversal of the way that things had been done in the past. But it's just, in some ways, it's been a necessity in order to keep those kind of programs uh, in our schedule. And I'm wondering if, as in theater, where we see fewer and fewer really big productions, unless maybe some musicals, but you have more small cast. Uh, For a period, there were a lot of one-person dramas. Is that changing um, the choices you make in terms of what productions you feel you can do, smaller cast or domestic settings versus, you know, something like a wolf hall, which takes expands, you know, beyond um, the domestic sphere. You're exactly right, Tequina. We we look for those projects and we're excited, you know, if they come to us. It's still quite a job to get financing for these shows. You know, it's not only us. We have to work with distributors. Uh, we have to work with broadcasters. And so we have to find shows where all of us, um, you know, feel that we're ready to invest. And the whole industry really has quieted down a bit since the strikes. And there have been fewer and fewer commissions just because, you know, people are reassessing um, how much they should be paying for shows and, you know, what their business plans are. And at the moment, we um, took a big risk and we are funding a adaptation of the Foresight Saga. We've you know, taken some risk to see uh, if we can come up with a big costume drama that could be a returner. And uh, we'll see, but uh, we can't do that all the time. So we do have to be looking for the smaller pieces. And I would say Miss Austin is like that. It's it's smaller in scope, yeah. um, but still is... Uh, still, I think, delivers in terms of the writing and the performances and kind of the enjoyment um, piece. What that reminds me of is there's an exhibition at the National Gallery of Art right now. It's Impressionism 1874. Hmm. And you see the move from these big, massive biblical, mythological themes in art to people at the theater, women with their babies. Two sisters sitting on a couch together. So you're right. Maybe we're seeing domestic that movement. Life. Yes, in domestic life, everyday people, not the idealized form of women or men, but kind of the real people. Yeah. You're absolutely right. And uh, you know, Foresight Saga is written exactly in that time period, kind of 1870 is uh, when it begins. Um, so yeah, very interesting. And it has an art collector in it. <laughs> yeah. It Suzanne, Suzanne, what you just said and described in terms of how you're working reminds me of something I believe I saw on a masterpiece series. You know, you build the railroad and the train will come. <laughs> Was that Cranbrook? 
I can't remember which one, but I think it was Cranford. Yes, I think it was Cranford. Cranford. Um, Cranford. Cranford. Yeah. Yeah. Cranford. You know, I, I've been saying lately <laughs> to people because, um, you know, I'll just share with you this job is is not easy. I mean, we are in competition with so many big streamers and, uh, you know, even smaller streamers. Um, and so it's, you know, we are working very hard to make sure we get the best shows that we can within, within the budget framework that we have to work with. But I've been feeling like I'm like Lord Grantham which is that I've inherited the family house and it is my job to make sure during my time period as executive producer that I take care of that house the best way I can so that I can hand it off to the future. Mm. And so I am trying different things to do that, to kind of meet the time where we are now and make sure that our audience feels they are getting, um, you know, some really great shows that they can look forward to. And I have to balance things out in terms of how much I can pay for one show and how much I can pay for another. I have to balance, you know, I, I would call it, you know, kind of art house drama like Wolf Hall and a very accessible, cozy murder mystery, because our audience swings kind of across all of that. And we want to make sure that we're, you know, able to hold on to our audience who expects the best we can give them. So I'm trying to do that every day. Yeah. Well, I will say the quality is definitely consistent. And it does, I think, set a standard for what is considered really good historical drama. And um, I always say my favorite historical dramas are the ones that show the impact of historical events in the everyday lives of people and that show you the really human dimensions of what it's like to adapt to power, whether it's power or change. I think the thing about Downton Abbey that really grabbed people was it was a mirror of what is it like to live through a time of very rapid change because that's that's our lives now. Yes, I, I think that's exactly right. I think Julian really understood what he was trying to do by putting focus on that particular time period with the very wealthy families in the UK. And were they going to adapt or were they going to die? There weren't that many uh, options for them either at the time. Right. So, yes. And, and they had a pandemic that they lived through as well. Yeah, they did. They did. Suzanne, you have a wonderful house that is open to everyone with Masterpiece because it is part of the public media family. So everyone in the United States and the U.S. territories, military bases can watch these dramas <clears throat> for free without having to pay a fee. Though we do encourage people to support their local PBS station. Absolutely. That's, I hope we can say that. <laughs> we can absolutely say that, and we greatly appreciate it because um, the stations are the ones who are really supporting our efforts, and uh, we you know, can't do this without them. We can't do it without our amazing sponsors, Viking and Raymond James. You know, it, it takes um, – and PBS and our distributor, PBSD, it, t it takes a lot of people – to really make this happen. And I am just grateful that over the years, we've developed these wonderful relationships with some of the very best UK talent, the producers, the writers, you know, the directors. And so, you know, we're able to really find shows that, you know, we all love watching, right? I mean, these are the shows I yeah. love. So, yeah. Thank you for coming back again for our annual <laughs> highlights of the new season of Masterpiece and Mystery. So we'll be back 
next year for the next update. And we'll also be featuring some of the series we're looking for. Of course, we're going to do Miss Austin. We're going to do Wolf Hall. That's being announced now on this podcast, Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you. I really appreciate you inviting me on to talk about these shows. I, um, you, you know, you have very challenging questions sometimes, and, and I just really enjoy that about it. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. For our audience, Masterpiece and Mystery air Sunday nights on PBS. Check your local listings. You can also stream the series on PBS Passport, the PBS Masterpiece Prime Video channel, and for free for 14 days from broadcast on pbs.org backslash masterpiece. Share this podcast with someone you know who will enjoy the conversation. Subscribe to Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters wherever you enjoy your favorite podcast. Leave a review. We hope you'll give us five stars. Sign up for the e-newsletter to stay up to date on new podcasts, bonus episodes, and historical drama-related activities. Follow us on Instagram at Historical Drama Sisters and on Facebook at Historical Drama Boston Sisters. Like and share Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters on your social media. This is Michonne Boston. And this is Tequina Boston. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters, a podcast about historical films and series dramas. Visit our webpage at michonnebostongroup.com backslash Boston Sisters. Tell us what historical dramas you're watching. Who knows? We may do a show about it. Sign up for our newsletter, subscribe to the podcast, and share it with the people you know who binge on historical drama. Historical Drama with the Boston Sisters is brought to you by the Michonne Boston Group. The views and opinions expressed on historical drama with the Boston Sisters are those of the speakers and do not represent the positions or views of the Michonne Boston Group, its clients or affiliates. This is Michonne Boston. And this is Tequina Boston. Thank you for listening.